John George Haig was born in Thumford, Lincolnshire on July the 24th, 1909 and raised by strictly religious parents. The family moved to Wakefield when he was young, where they lived on Ledger Lane and Altwood. He secured a scholarship to Queen Elizabeth Grammar School, the city's independent school for boys, and many years later, Stephen Griffiths, also a former pupil of the school, would go on to be convicted of killing three women in Bradford. I've also done a video on Stephen, so be sure to check it out if you're not familiar with him and his crimes. During this time in the city, John became a chorister at Wakefield Cathedral, where he was described by a fellow choristers as a brainy lad but a bit of a loner. A photo submitted to the Wakefield Express in the years following his death shows John as a smiling choir boy and it was widely reported that his childhood ambition was to become a vampire. His parents belonged to a religious sect known as the Plymouth Brethren who were purists and anti-clerical. Almost all forms of casual entertainment, music, carnivals, magazines and newspapers were regarded as sinful and only stories from the Bible were tolerated. According to his father, the world was evil and the family needed to keep themselves separate. As his father had told him, the blue blemish on his own head had been from a result of him sinning in his youth. It is perhaps not surprising that John became terrified of developing a similar sign of the devil. It is argued that the turning point in the boy's development came when he realised that no such blemish had appeared, despite him having lied and just about broken every rule in the book. In fact, he began to believe that he was invincible and he could get away with anything. On leaving school, he was apprenticed to a firm of motor engineers. However, this only lasted a year and he scraped a living in sales insurance and advertising and any job that demanded a snappy dressing and the gift of the gab. By the age of 21, he had already been sacked for suspected theft. In July 1934, John married the 23-year-old Beatrice Hammer. Unfortunately, the marriage soon fell apart. The same year, he was jailed for fraud and Beatrice gave birth whilst he was in prison but gave the baby up for adoption and left him. Not surprisingly, his family ostracised him from that point onwards and in 1936 he moved to London and became chauffeur to William McSwan, the wealthy owner of amusement parlours. He used his mechanical gifts to maintain William's amusement machines. Following that he became a bogus solicitor and received a four year jail sentence for fraud. He was released just after the start of World War II and somehow missed being called up continuing as a pretty unsuccessful petty criminal and being sentenced to several terms of imprisonment. Whilst inside Lincoln Prison, he began planning the most startling series of perfect murders. He learned much from other criminals and avidly read books on acids which he found easily available in the prison library. Using glass jars from the kitchens, dead field mice brought in from fields and small quantities of acid taken from the tinsmith shop he carried our experiments to see how long it would take a small body to dissolve in acid. It was not long before he had devised a formula to apply to humans. In 1994, John renewed his friendship with the McSwans and rented a small basement workshop at number 79 Gloucester Road in Kensington, where he allegedly worked on his inventions. On September the 9th, he took McSwan's son Donald to his workshop and bludgeoned him to death. He then placed Donald's body in a 40 gallon barrel filled with sulfuric acid. Later, he covered the drum and went home to sleep. The next day, the remains of Donald McSwan were little more than cold liquid and lumps which he disposed of down a drain. By forging various documents, he obtained all Donald's assets and told his bemused mother that he had gone away to avoid conscription. He even sent fake postcards to them from Scotland, pretending to be their son. Again, using forged documentation, he managed to obtain the McSwan's property in Rains Park, Wimbledon Park and Beckham Park, not to mention around £4,000 in cash before continuing with his plans to dispose of the remainder of the McSwan family. 
According to a police statement, he also murdered a middle-aged woman from Hammersmith. The McSwans disappeared on the 2nd of July 1945 and they were killed in similar fashion to Donald. He hit them first, killing them and then claimed to have drunk their blood before dissolving them in acid baths. In August 1947, John met Dr Archibald Henderson and his wife Rosalie a couple which he befriended. By this time he was renting a small basement property in Leopold Road, Crawley and on the 12th of February 1948 he drove Mr Henderson to Crawley on the pretext of showing him an invention. When they arrived he shot Dr Henderson in the head with a revolver he had earlier stolen from the doctor's house. He then lured Mrs Henderson to the workshop claiming her husband had fallen ill and shot her also. After disposing of the Henderson's bodies in oil drums filled with acid, he forged a letter from them and sold all their possessions for £8,000. In 1949 he chanced upon his last victim, Olivia Durand Deacon. He was 69 and the wealthy widow of solicitor John Durand Deacon and fellow resident at the Onslow Court Hotel. She mentioned to John, by then calling himself an engineer, an idea that she had for artificial fingernails. He invited her down to the Crawley workshop and once inside he shot her in the back of the head, stripped her of all her valuables including a Persian lamb coat and then put her into the acid bath. Unfortunately for John, this murder netted very little profit. He sold her coat and a few odd bits of jewellery which just about paid the hotel bill and covered his most pressing expenses. And it was time for him to look for another victim. He found one in the form of Olivia's friend, Mrs Constance Lane, who was also a retired lady living in the hotel. She was deeply concerned by her friend's disappearance and plied John with questions, one of which nearly knocked him off his perch. Don't you know where she is? She told me you were taking her down to your factory. Well, I must do something about that. To avoid suspicion, he offered to go to the police station with her and report the matter. At Chelsea Police Station, the officer on duty recognised John and ran a background check on him. On February 28th, the police brought him in for questioning whilst they searched his hotel room and workshop. The search revealed not only John's case containing a dry cleaner's receipt for Mrs Durand Deacon's coat, but also papers referring to the Hendersons and McSwans, and a diary in which he kept abbreviated details of his other murders. Further investigation of the sludge at the workshop by the pathologist Keith Simpson revealed Olivia's plastic handbag, 28 pounds of human fat, corroded human bones, three human gallstones and a part of a denture which was later identified by Mrs Durand Deacon's donated during the trial. Despite the forensic evidence, it was John's very own sense of invincibility and arrogance that was to be his greatest undoing. He was of the opinion that nothing could be found from his human slaughterhouse and cockily recounted in great detail his exclaves of death. When questioned by Detective Inspector Albert Webb, John asked him, tell me, frankly, what are the chances of anybody being released from Broadmoor? The inspector said that he could not discuss that sort of thing, so John replied, well, if I told you the truth, you would not believe me. It sounds too fantastic to believe. John then confessed that he had not only killed Olivia Durand Deacon, the McSwans and Hendersons, but also three other people, a young man called Max, a girl from Eastbourne, and a woman from Hammersmith. On Thursday, March the 3rd, 1949, London's Daily Mirror began a series of macabre stories about murder that began with the headline, Hunt for the Vampire. They did not name names, but there was no prizes for guessing who they were referring to. John was put on trial on Monday the 18th of August, 1949, at the Sussex Excises in Leeds. He had nobody to pay for his defence, so the news of the World newspaper did a deal with him and offered to pay for the council if he would provide them with an exclusive. The Daily Mail newspaper was found in contempt of court for explicitly portraying John as a vampire. The editor, Sylvester Bonham, was sentenced to three months in prison 
The paper also had to pay £10,000 in court fees. The jury retired on the second day and it took just 17 minutes to find him perfectly sane and guilty of murder. Mr Justice Travers Humphreys sentenced him to death and it was announced that there would be no appeal. It was reported that John in the Congdon cell at Wandsworth Prison asked one of the prison guards, Jack Norwood, whether it would be possible to have a trial run of his hiring so everything would run smoothly. It is likely that his request went no further but if it did the request was denied. He also wrote to one of his solicitors saying when I was sentenced to death by Sir Travers Humphreys I couldn't stop laughing. I saw the judge don his black cap and he looked the entire world like a sheep in its head peering out from under a rebar leaf. On Wednesday the 10th of August, a crowd of around 500 people gathered outside Wandsworth Prison in bright sunshine. At 9am, John was hanged by Albert Pierpoint, assisted by Harry Kirk. John finished his life story for the newspaper that had paid for his trial and wrote letters to his parents who did not see him before he died. His mother sent greetings through a reporter. He also told reporters that he believed in reincarnation and that he would be back to complete his mission. Madame Tussauds requested a fitting for a death mask and he was happy to oblige. For some years, his waxwork was exhibited in the Chambers of Horrors at Madame de Sors in London. So that's everything I've got for this case. I hope you guys have all enjoyed and I'll see you all in the next one.